Hi, Alan Irwin from Santa Barbara Infrared, and in this video we're going to be talking about minimum resolvable temperature difference, more typically known as MRTD. So what does MRTD measure? MRTD is a subjective test that measures the minimum temperature difference needed to resolve targets with specific sizes. So let's talk about what all those components are. First of all, it's a subjective test. What that means is that we have humans that are making the observation. This isn't an objective analysis from some piece of equipment. We have to have a human observer that's looking at an image and deciding whether or not there's a pass or a fail. Uh, when we talk about resolving an image, what we have is we see here a four bar target. And what's important is not to just be able to see something there, but to be able to see four bars. You need to resolve the image. And when we do this multiple times, we take different size four bars, we can create this graph, which is the MRTD graph. And what we're seeing here are four different measurements that were taken. That means we have four different sizes of targets, and we had an observer decide what the minimum temperature is. Came up with this graph. So why do we use this graph? Well, what's important is in the upper region above the graph, that's everything we can resolve. Anything in that space means that a human observer should be able to resolve that image. On the other side, everything in that area of the space, we cannot resolve. If it's too small with too low a temperature, we're off in the non-resolvable space. And that's important to realize here that the horizontal axis is spatial frequency, just like what we've seen before, and the vertical axis is the temperature we need to be able to see that spatial frequency. So what's also important to note with this test is that there are some problems. So let's go through those. The first problem we have with the test is that it's subjective. Human observers are not that reliable. They don't produce the same result all the time. They get tired through the course of a day. They've had arguments with their spouses. They've had their coffee. They haven't. All these elements impact somebody's ability to see something. So you don't get reliable, repeatable results from an observer. The way this can be dealt with is to have multiple observers doing, mul doing measurements on the same camera multiple times and try to average out that variability. But that's costly. But that's one way to deal or try to deal with that subjective problem. The next is something called background drift. Because, as you saw previously, we have these pieces of metal with four bars in them, and they're sitting in front of a black body, and a human observer is taking a fair amount of time to decide what the right temperature is, those targets get heated up. Measurements are not taken of the background right at the target. They're, they're measured some distance away. So you actually get a drift or a slight offset between the background of the target and the and the actual temperature that we're measuring. However, the observer doesn't know that, and so they keep setting the difference of the temperature with the black body to what they observe, and so you get this step that's occurring that is gradually increasing with time as the temperature of the system drifts. The way we deal with that is that after we take what's referred to as a positive measurement, we flip the temperature of the target and have the observer make another measurement at a negative temperature, and we can see what the temperature difference is that's needed to see black bars or, or negative temperature bars. If we do that one right after another, we still have the same offset, but we have different measurements. And we can average those two measurements to determine what our true measurement is. That's why when we talk about the procedure of the test, we take a measurement at a hot bar, a white bar, and we take a measurement at a cold bar or a black bar. The next problem we have is inconsistent resolve criteria. And this is really from one lab to the next, or it could be from one observer to the next, depending on whether somebody has set up the criteria. When I say I resolve a target, what does that mean? Well, do I have to clearly see all four bars completely, or can I get by with just seeing three bars? Is that resolving? Every lab has a different criteria. At our lab, we say you need to see four bars, but 75% of the total area. So that's uh, our specific criteria, and you may go to another lab with a slightly different criteria and get different results. So it's important to understand whether, when you're comparing results from different labs, they're using the same criteria. The other problem with this test are the time constraints. I've already mentioned that to deal with human observers, we sometimes have to have multiple times they've taken the test or multiple observers so that we can average them. That takes time. And when you're in a production facility and you're trying to get high production out of a camera, that's a big impact. It's expensive. So the time constraints on doing the camera sometimes force us to do less effective results. For instance, we may only run it once with one observer, and that's it. All right, so with all these problems, why do we do the test? Well, this graph is really what the whole point of the test is about. We have this can resolve and cannot resolve area. Because if we think about what we're looking at, this next slide shows 
how we can see an object and what the size is. This is similar to one we saw in the MTF when we were talking about spatial frequencies. So you know that something small, even though it's close, can appear large. That's important. But we also know the temperature of what we think we're looking at. If we're looking at a person, we know it's somewhere around 100 Fahrenheit. And if we're looking at a tank, it's somewhere around 200 to 1700, depending on whether the tank is running or not. But we know roughly the temperature, and we know the size of an object, depending on what we're looking for. Well, that tells us what our spatial frequency is, and we know what the temperature. And the spatial frequency that we calculate for a human is dependent on their distance from us. So we can draw a line showing the effective spatial frequency based on the distance, and we can decide how far away we can resolve or tell that that's a person, a human being, or a tank, or whatever we have in our model that we're trying to identify. So this graph tells us some very important things. What's the efficacy of our camera? How far away do, can we see something that we're interested in? Now, this is a pretty simple description. Really, when we're modeling a system, there are a lot more details that go into deciding what the effective temperature is and what the effective range is. So there, there's more detail than what I have here. But that's the essence of it, our ability to tell the distance at which we can see something because we know the size we're expecting and we know the temperature of the thing we'll be looking for. What do we need to run the test? Well, traditional equipment. We need a black body. In this case, it's got to be calibrated. We're going to be taking very small measurements. Uh, and so it's important for us to be able to set that black body accurately. We are also interested in being able to resolve this image, and so we need to have an effective target projection system. We're going to be taking our four bar targets, put it at focus in these optical systems, and project it to the camera so that we get a good, effective, uh, sized object. We can control the size, we can control the temperature, and that's what we need to be able to stimulate the system for the observer. So we've got those elements. What we need is that four bar target. That's the target that goes right at focus. And this is how they're typically constructed. We have a piece of metal. We've drilled these four bars into them. Uh, and we know the size of the bars. And that determines our spatial frequency. We know the size of the bars. We know the effective distance to the optics of the target system. So we can determine spatial frequency on that four bar. Now, what I've described before is referred to as an emissive target. In other words, we've got the uh, temperature of the target based on the ambient, and we are looking through at the black body behind it. There's another way we can approach this test, and that's if instead of making the target black so that it's the temperature of the rest of the room, we can make the target reflective. We can put a gold deposit on it so it's highly reflective. And now we can set another black body in front of the target so that it sets the temperature reflected off the target. And now what we see is this reflected temperature, and we can also see the black body temperature behind it. That allows us to more precisely control that temperature difference than a human observer can, can make out. Um, this isn't commonly done because it's fairly expensive, but for those who need very precise calculation, very precise control over that differential temperature, you will hear people refer to a reflective system when they're doing the MRTD measurements. When we do a test, we identify how many steps we're going to do. You saw a four-step MRTD. Three is fairly common. Some people do higher counts, but again, that takes more time. It makes your observer more tired. There are problems when you go much higher. So four counts are the typical size that we take. And then the starting temperature, and we allow the observer to make adjustments to temperature in the course of the test. All of those are the elements that are ideally already automated for you so that you can walk an observer through and collect measurements as they go to high temperature, hot temperature and cold temperature measurements. That's the basic idea of MRTD. So why do we use it? Well, again, I mentioned characterizing cameras and detecting failures. We expect a certain MRTD result, and so we can compare a camera to see whether or not it's meeting its MRTD requirements and determine whether it's failed. We can also compare devices within a model series so that if there is a way we can do a calibration step, we can make that calibration to bring all the models into alignment. Um, but we also use it for comparing cameras across models and different manufacturers. Again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are, all those missions that we model. And, and it is modeling when you decide what it is you're going to be looking at, and you have an MRTD curve, and you need to identify how far away something you'll be able to see. That MRTD, or required MRTD, based on your mission, uh, defines the kind of camera you're looking for. So you can compare different cameras with different MRTDs. So lastly, let's talk about the trade-offs in time for these tests. If you're in a laboratory where you're characterizing a camera, then you can do your three observers doing multiple times, take as much time as you need, because you're just doing a one-time run to really effectively characterize your camera. If you're in a production environment, that drops down. Basically, what you're looking for is your camera meeting expectations. So you can get by with a single observer doing a single set of four bars and try to get through the test that way. When you're in the field and you're about ready to go on a mission, you don't want to be running these tests. So what is commonly done is a more simple test called a resolution test. 
in a pass-fail method. Basically, you put up a single four-bar target at a known temperature, and if the observer can see it, you assume you pass and everything's okay. If they can't see it, you assume the camera's failed and drop out. So depending on the time trade-offs, you get a more accurate, clearly if you're doing pass-fail, you're not going to get characterizing of the camera. But if you've got the time, you can do the more precise MRTD measurement. If you don't, you get by with a pass-fail criteria. That's the basic idea of MRTD. It gives you a good introduction to it, and when you talk about it, there's probably more details that we could have gotten into, but that's the good introduction to the MRTD test.